Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're looking at what it takes to support children and families struggling with housing instabilities with our special guest, Aaron Fisher, Chief Executive Officer of Bright Beginnings. So, Aaron, thank you so much for, for being with us and for really illuminating this, this very important issue, uh, particularly in our nation's capital. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, so I'm going to set you up here with this idea that that if you take a look at Washington, D.C., um, uh, D.C. Uh, ranks 15 in per capita homelessness uh, uh, amongst uh, urban centers in the nation. And by mid-2020, 23, it was estimated that 11.6% of DC residents were homeless. Is that correct? I think if we think about the way we define homelessness, that might be really where the issue lies. So I think, you know, often people think about homelessness as people who are out on the street, they're living in tents. And we do have that in DC. I mean, just on my way in today um, by the Watergate building, there are tents, there are people there. But also, there are plenty of people who are experiencing homelessness in different ways in the city. So that could be that they're in a shelter. It could be that they're part of the rapid rehousing program that the city offers. It could be that they're doubled up living in maybe someone else's home. And those definitions of homelessness and ha being housing unstable, that really, that adds to that too. So it's more than just what people think of when they think about homelessness in a city and people being outside. Yeah, and it's it's really stunning because when you look at, at at our major cities, and it's it's definitely true in Washington, right? The Watergate area, that's where the Kennedy Center is, and so on. It's it's an area of tremendous wealth, uh, mm -hmm. tremendous uh, stability, and and um, certainly people who live in that area um, permanently have incomes. But there's a there's a whole group of people who live in that area as, as transients. Uh, they're couch surfing. They are um, they are sometimes living on the street and in tents. They are sometimes living in temporary housing and in, in group uh, facilities. Um, and, and sometimes uh, when it gets very bad, uh, there are uh, not only temporary uh, places that are set up, but then you have to move people after a while and then you dislocate them again. How do you deal with this disruption as a child? where you're trying to go to school, you're trying to get nourished, and your day is constantly interrupted with these actions that your parents or your caretakers need to take, and you really are dealing with security on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Right. So I think you know it's hard for some of us to imagine living like that, right? And what I want to say, too, when I think about the work we do at Bright Beginnings, we're in Ward 8, and a lot, we don't have children who are living on the street. Our children are mostly doubled up. They might be in, so they, that means their parents are living with grandparents or aunts or uncles and friends. So our children, they might not have their bed, they might not have their own bedroom or they might be going between different places at night, but they're not out on the street in the way that people think of homelessness. So, but it still comes down to a security piece, right? So if you're worried about where your food is going to come from, whose house you're going to be sleeping at at night, like those are things that many of us don't really think about or we take for granted. And we don't realize the impact that that might have on a young child. So I think really for us at Bright Beginnings, it's about being stable and nurturing for our children. So that, and the other piece is that we're a two generation organization. So we believe that in order for a child to succeed, their parents have to succeed too. And so when parents enroll with us, they're enrolling their child in childcare or early childhood education, but they're also enrolling as the parent and setting goals themselves so that they can, you know, secure housing, build a career, maybe go back to school and those things. So for us, it's really about being stable in the community so that we could serve both children and families. So when you're talking about stable in the community, talk a little bit about your programs that that provide that stability, because we can talk all we want. But actually, when when the sun comes up in the morning, your people go to work. Talk a little bit about the work that they do. Right. So I think at the at the core, our work is in early childhood education. And I will say 
Um, so this is uh, me admitting that I didn't realize how hard the work of an early childhood educator was until I came to Bright Beginnings. So I was a K-12 educator. Third grade was my first year teaching. And I was like, oh, they cry too much. I can't do this. I do not want to be with third graders, right? So I went to sixth grade. I loved middle school. I was a middle school teacher, an instructional coach, a principal. Um, then I went to high school. And then, you know, I think part of what you realize as a educator is that you can only impact children so much when you're with them eight hours a day and you want to be able to provide all these wraparound services. So coming to Bright Beginnings and realizing that this early childhood education piece is, it's a science, it's an art and a science. And our teachers really are, you know, early childhood teaching as a whole is undervalued, but early childhood education is undervalued. If you walk into our infant classroom, those children are six weeks, six weeks old <laughs> to up to um, six months. And our teachers have lesson plans. It's un it's unbelievable. So I would say that like our bread and butter and why we're here is that early childhood education piece. So that brings our families to us. And we're actually, we just were evaluated and did tremendously on this. Um, it's called the infant and toddler environmental rating scale. So we're, we're doing a great job at providing for children and setting them up to enter kindergarten, ready to learn and on par with their higher resource peers. And that means so much to us. But like I said, that two generation approach is huge. And um, so what happens is when our families come to us, they um, are everyone is matched with a family advocate. So every parent has a family advocate. They do a family partnership agreement. And with that family partnership agreement, they set two goals for the year. And that goal could be related to, like I mentioned before, housing, going back to school, workforce development, maybe some mental health support. And we offer all of those those supports in-house to our families. So let me let me interrupt you right here because that is one of the first differences where your early childhood approach um, from somebody who has means and has stability. Right. You're dealing with the entire family, right? You're dealing with issues that can affect the child, but are not issues that you can deal with just one on one with the child. You have to deal with the caretaker as well. And you're you're organized for that, right? Absolutely. So is the first step building trust with with the caretaker so that the caretaker will actually open them open their hearts to to what you have to offer? Thank you for asking that. I think that's so important. And that relationship piece, anything in this work is so it's the human capital that does it right. So we need the right people in place to build trust. So when they first meet with the family advocate and so many of our like, I don't want to share stories that might exploit families, but our families go through a lot. And so being willing to share that with people, it does, it takes time, it takes building trust, but also, you know, after a week or two and they, our family see the same people at the door every day and the same teachers caring for their children, one of the best ways to build trust is to see someone interact with your own child in a way that you would, right? So if we're treating our children the way we would treat our own children, then that builds trust in itself. And I think that's what starts to help our families say like, you know what, they care about us. And that family advocate is responsible for that. So they are a tremendously important part of bringing families into the organization. How do you deal with the issues that, that people might have who come from different backgrounds and different circumstances? Uh, Washington, like so many other uh, places have been has been hit by um, refugees, asylum seekers. There, there are the transient people who grew up in and around Washington, but there are also people who are on the move. Um, how do you deal with these different circumstances and build trust? There's, there, there sometimes can be a racial dimension, a linguistic dimension, a cultural appropriateness direction. We can uh, issue. So, you know, we can't we can't go from from an assumption of instant connection. We have to build that connection. How do you do it? As an organization or me? 
as an organization, but also yeah. personally. I mean, each of yeah. your people are people, right? They have a right. gender, a race, an identity, an age, you know, a background. Not everybody can connect to everyone else. How do you match people up? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, it's something we're talking about as a leadership team too right now. Is like, how does our own personal identity impact the relationships we have with colleagues, also with the children and with our families? And, you know, I, it's not something that we can shy away from either. Like I explained to my team, I'm a white blonde woman from New Jersey. I've done this work since I graduated from University of Maryland, but my personal identity drives and how I might be perceived drives at every conversation that I have. Like, I'm very careful. It's like not thinking about it would be wrong, right? I have to think about it. We have to talk about it. And I think that we do that um, with our families too. But one of the things about Bright Beginnings and when I've been thinking about building relationships and we hire from within our community and that has been one of the most important things I think for us, DC is a small city, and people know each That's other. Square miles. I mean, you know, it's not it's it's not huge, right? So people know each other, and that is really that builds trust into itself as well. So I would say our small part of DC, we don't have a ton of racial diversity, we don't have a ton of ethnic diversity, but what we do have are people who know the community and know each other. So we, um, for example, we're across the street from Baloo Senior High School. They have an alternative high school program, uh, Baloo Stay. In that program, they have a child development associate program. They need to intern. So for us, we bring them over to intern. And then from there, we've been able to hire three to four of them full time. So that's I'm sorry, I spoke. It was uh, DC's area is, is 70 square miles. It's, it's, it's about 10 by 10. Right. It is, yep. No. But, but but this this point is so very important, right? You have teachers who come with their experiences. You have parents who come with their experiences. When you say that you're that you're hiring from within your population, what defines your population? Are you hiring people who have gone through themselves homeless experiences? Have you have you hired people who are uh, in earlier days, like your clients or are your clients? Is that how you actually approach that 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 uh, challenge of connection? That's exactly how we approach the challenge of connection. So one of our um, master teachers, who's phenomenal, she started in our program by enrolling her child and went through and got the CDA credential and then her AA and her bachelor's. And she's working on her master's now. Her children have graduated from college. So She's a success story, but we have multiple people that are in the program whose children go here. And then from that, you know, we hire them as well. And we have fathers who have um, been, who've had their children here, who we've also hired. And so that's, I think it's unique to us and it presents different challenges because when you're supporting families, that the families that we support and when you're supporting the families, but your staff is experiencing many of those same issues, it becomes, it's incredibly complex. And we're constantly balancing, how do we help push our staff forward while also helping to push our families forward and our children forward? So it's something we're always thinking about. And I don't feel like I have a great way yet to talk about it because I don't, there's not so many organizations that have that similar approach. So it, it's, a t it's tough. Well, and, and, you know, maybe not having a way to talk about it is important as well. This is a whole person, whole family, and whole society approach, right? This is coming together and understanding that, you know, we have a complicated situation that we all have to pitch in and, and solve for each other and for ourselves. And there isn't going to be this sort of easy uh, formulaic answer. It just, it just isn't the nature of these of these problems. The way you're solving it is the way we in America ought to be solving our problems, isn't it? I would think so. I mean, I really believe in what we're doing. And really at the forefront of the work is that our parents' voices and our children's voices need to be heard. Because if you're going it if you're going through the experiences, then you know what you need. And you just need somebody to listen to help you get what you need. You know, how can somebody from outside actually tell you what you need? 
if they've never experienced it themselves. Right. So we are really intentional about providing opportunities for voice from our children and then also from our parents and our staff. You're also pointing to uh, another issue that I'd like to unpack with you because it's great when, when there's a success story, but there's also so many different uh, issues that you encounter that stability leads to inconsistency of attendance, mm -hmm. inconsistency of response. Uh, you might be dealing with people who have uh, problems uh, of addiction or uh, interactions with the criminal justice system. How do you deal with that? Because you can't be investing resources in places where Although your intent is good, those those resources are being absorbed to no positive impact. How do you make those kinds of decisions? I think in those situations, the relationship is so important because at the end of the day, the child is the most important piece, right? So if we're experiencing a situation like that with a parent, if our children for if our children come with us come to us at six weeks and this might happen when they're three, we've known that child for nearly three years and we've known that family for nearly three years. So at that point, it's our responsibility to know this child's support system outside of the parent who might be struggling. So really, our answer in that case is, OK, who are we calling? Are we, are we calling grandpa? Are we calling grandma? Are we calling an aunt? How are we making sure that there's stability for the child? And then there's also a plan in place for the parent who might be struggling. So we, and so we say we take a two generation approach. I would say we take a three generation approach to the whole family, <laughs> you know, because that's, it's the relationship is the most important part and ensuring that we provide the stability for the child. Could you talk a little bit about how you reach how, your decision process? in terms of how you uh, provide support to children, to their families, because this is not, you know, this is so very sensitive. This is not a top-down kind of executive decision kind of a thing. You really need to have people with different perspectives and perhaps different types of expertise, different types of insight. So walk me through a situation where th that is complicated and how you actually approach this. So when our parents and our families come to us, we go through an interview. Pro it's like an interview process, but we gather information along the way and we evaluate our families on a self self-sufficiency matrix. OK, now the self-sufficiency matrix has been used. It, it, you know, we kind of tailored it to our families. It's flawed, but it helps us to identify our family's needs and then our families who and we kind of group and I don't love these names, we're working our way through it, or these categories, but we kind of group our families in crisis, vulnerable, stable, or self-sufficient. Our families who are in crisis, we meet bi-weekly through, we call it our care team model. So when we go to care team, we have our multidisciplinary team coordinator, who she does a lot of the assessments of children, but also assessments of families. We have a therapist there. We have our family advocates there. Our workforce development team is there. And we will discuss the needs of the family. Sometimes the family will come as well and share what their needs are. And then we really put an action plan in place that will address that crisis situation to hope, like, hopefully be able to stabilize and move, like address the immediate needs so that the parent and the child are stable. And then we can begin to address those things that could support them in moving along this matrix to eventually become self-sufficient. So that, but that, just like you said, it brings everyone together and really problem solving there. Then two weeks later, we come back together. We might have another family to talk about, but we always go back to the data points related to the previous um, family. Do you also uh, assemble data to show that you're, now this might be a little self-serving, but um, to show that, that your involvement is having a, positive outcome and where you might be able to improve. You know, part of this, part of keeping yourself honest is by looking at where things might be able to be better. Uh, how do you actually assemble that data and how do you talk to each other and how do you evolve, how do you evolve the organization as you move march into the future? Yep, that's a great question. I think for us, that self-sufficiency matrix, we do that twice a year. 
So we're able to evaluate and see, have parents moved out of one crisis, out of the crisis category, and maybe to vulnerable or maybe to stable. And so that is, and then we're able to look at the categories that parents are experiencing the most. So like one place where we, especially during the pandemic and post pandemic, and we've seen some um, issues with SNAP, which is food stamps, is food inst food instability. So when we kept seeing that data show up, we were like, okay, so when we built the budget this year, we put in emergency funds for parents related to food. And that has been, so we use that data to kind of plan for the budget for the following year. But then also to say, like, one of the things that we saw is that we were having parents who really were struggling with finding and keeping jobs. Okay, so what does our workforce development department need to be working on? Like, what are the soft skills that we're missing, our parents are missing that can help them keep those jobs or what we other, the other thing we found out is that our hours weren't working for parents' employment. So we are like, okay, I've got it. We've got to shift some things. And it was really hard during COVID because we had the children in pods and we couldn't, you know, bring them together. But post COVID now we've been able to extend our hours for our, our program during the day. We also offer evening care, which is fully accredited from four to 11 for parents who work non-traditional hours. So like we've also offered that because we're seeing people post pandemic working more non-traditional hours. The thing that really strikes me as you're as you're describing this is that is that is there seems to be a constant negotiation within your team about what is right, what's what's the most effective way to spend time and effort and money on uh, bringing people to a a higher level of self sufficiency. But you're also negotiating with parents. You're also bringing them along. You're. You, it seems like your approach is to empower the parents and not talk over them. There may be some conversations that are that are done just amongst your team without the parents there. But really, it is still the parents' right to accept or refuse or guide or adjust your your treatment plan. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say. You know, that's my, as a principal, that was my my approach. You know, the kids need to drive what we're doing. And the same thing, you know, Upright Beginnings. Our, our kids help design our newest playground. Our staff help design their new workspace. And our parents help design, you know, what, what they need from us. We also, because we're a Head Start organization, um, part of our governing body is a parent policy council. So anytime we apply for grants, we also have to, like my board has to approve it, but our policy council has to approve it too. So they approve the whole grant, they approve the budget and everything as well. So it really is, I mean, the model of Head Start does make sure that the parent voice is heard as well. Do you think that that this, uh, th th this seems to be what you're describing is a partnership um, that is facilitated by local volunteers, by the parent clients themselves, mm -hmm. but there's there's a government role. And you also have independent funders who um, are providing funding for their own reasons. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that this, this model is particularly effective where you have these different players and each, each one brings their piece of, uh, of the puzzle together and you kind of assemble it on a daily basis? Is that the most effective way to do this? Or should this just become a, a government program integrated into the schools and, and you know, that's it? I have to say, I it once I figured it out, I love the freedom of it. That's, it's, we're able to identify, oh, this is a need. And we're seeing this come up over and over again. Let's go ahead, if this might not fit into Head Start, because Head Start is our federal funding, we get local funding from the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. Okay, this might not fit in with them, but we we have this need. Where are we going to find money for it? And so one of the things that we notice is that when our children leave us, you know, we provide all of these support services to the children and to their parents. And then they go to kindergarten and, you know, no knock on traditional public schools or for charter schools. But they don't have the funding to, to have a family services team, a health services team, like and everything that we have, right, that is part of Head Start. So we have seen our children leave us and their families are like calling, hey, we need an Uber gift card. We, we're missing food. So 
we built an alumni program. We found funding for an alumni program. So we're just, and what's awesome about that is we can continue that support. And then we can also track how our children do when they leave us, which is beneficial for us as an organization when we go out for funding. So what you're saying is, is that there is a role for the solidity and the stability of a bureaucracy, Mm -hmm. but there's also a role for um, an organization like yours that are maneuvering between bureaucracies, between constituents, you can you can turn on a dime if you see a need. You if if somebody needs food, you can provide it. And it's really a, a matter of responsiveness, innovation, and change that your independence allows you to facilitate and allows you to remain um, aligned to the needs of your client base. Absolutely, and I think you know when I was. A- principal. I loved my kids so much and I miss them. But I think uh, people always ask, will you go back to K-12? I'm like, no, because I can do anything here. Like when we see the need, we can fill it and we'll figure out a way to do it. And that really is the flexibility of the funding. And it's exciting. It's exciting for children. It's exciting for families. It's exciting for my staff. Aaron Fisher, Chief Executive Officer of Bright Beginnings. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Please thank your staff. Please thank your clients. Please thank your donors. Please thank your board members. Please thank your constituents. You've done great, great work. And thank you so much for explaining it to us. It enlightens us and and helps to inform how we will spend our day. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me.